Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Tonight we're going to do part three of the knife safety, knife use series. Uh, tonight's going to be all about first aid. This is not going to be an in-depth first aid course or nothing like that. It's going to be just the basics regarding cuts. We'll go over real quick some major cuts, blood control, that kind of stuff. But this is not going to be a real in-depth course. I'm going to try to keep it as short as I can for you all, but still try to cover as much as I can, if that makes sense. Like I said in the last video, most of your cuts you're going to get are going to be on your hands. <clears throat> most will be minor. Something that a band-aid will take care of. Me, myself, if I cut my fingers, I try to let it bleed for just a few seconds. That way, if there's any dirt or anything in there, it kind of gets cleaned out. And then I'll start with my whole process of trying to stop the bleeding and all of that. The number one thing that I go to to try and stop bleeding is a good old fashioned handkerchief. I always carry one or two of them. Usually have one in my pocket and one in my pack. Uh, also, I carry a little sandwich bag full of boo boo items. And I'll go over that here in a few minutes. Another thing I always carry is a tourniquet. It's one of those things that you carry it and you hope you never need it. But it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. And we'll go over tourniquets here in a few minutes. Most instances, you won't need a tourniquet. Me, myself, I've never had to use a tourniquet out in the woods when I've cut myself. Even when I almost cut those two fingers off, I didn't have to use one then. I was able to control the bleeding with believe it or not, a handkerchief. But <clears throat> we'll get into all of that here in just a little bit. To get started, most minor cuts don't take a whole lot to get the blood stopped. You can take a handkerchief, put it on it, and just hold it for a couple of minutes, and the blood is stopped. Then you can kind of clean it up a little bit, put some antibiotic ointment on it and a Band-Aid and go on. Now, when you get into more serious cuts, and by serious cuts, I mean, for instance, here not too long ago, I cut the side of my finger, oh, a good three quarters of an inch, inch. Probably could have used a stitch or two in it, but I didn't go full with it. I was able to get the bleeding stopped. A lot of times what I do on those is I'll take my hang handkerchief, I'll come to one end of it, and wrap it around that area that's cut and then pull it real good and tight. Come down below it a little bit, same thing. Come back over it. As you can see, I'm just making a gob around there. Then pull that over like that and hold it and keep it wrapped up like that. Usually for the bigger, deeper cuts, I'll have to do this and keep it wrapped up for four or five minutes. And that, believe it or not, I don't know if you can see the end of my finger, <laughs> it's already starting to change color because I've got it pulled so tight. And see how it's turning purple. And if you need to, you can pull it tighter, you can loosen it up, whatever you need to do. But a lot of times that right there is how I deal with most of my cuts is just bandana and do that. <clears throat> After I've done that for a few minutes, I'll unwrap it, make sure it's not bleeding, then go into the process of cleaning the blood off of it, putting antibiotic ointment on it, putting a Band-Aid, a gauze pad, whatever, and doing it up that way. That way it's clean, for one, to 
the blood's controlled and then it's covered so nothing else gets back into it. Now, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, if you'll get one in a certain area on your finger around a knuckle or something, you may have to make a little splint and put that little splint on it to keep from bending it and popping it back open. And on that, we'll say cut, let's do it this way. Say that's my cut. What you do after you get it bandaged, you'll put that splint on it, just like that. And then you'll tape it back here behind the cut and up here in front of the cut to keep from bending it and popping it back open. <clears throat> and usually that's a problem when you cut anywhere around the knuckle, uh, be it on the side, the top, the bottom, wherever. Bending it, it's going to want to pop back open. So you may have to immobilize that finger just to help keep from popping it back open once you've got the bleeding stopped. A trick that my father taught me that works. It's painful, but it works. Dad always carried one of those cardboard salt shakers that you buy at the store that comes in the pack with the salt and the pepper. He always carried one of them in the glove box of the truck. And it wasn't until I got my first serious cut that I found out why. Uh, I <laughs> had got a butterfly knife and was playing with that butterfly knife and sliced myself across the top of that knuckle. And in the process of trying to get the bleeding stopped, we got it stopped for the most part, but dad went out to the truck and got the salt shaker. We were at my uncle's house. Got the salt shaker out of the truck and come back in there. Had me bend that finger just enough that it opened up. And then he poured table salt in it. Now, yes, it burns to beat the dickens. But the thing that I noticed is after he poured that table salt in there, it started absorbing the blood and it got wet. Then with the air hitting it after a few minutes, it turned brown and then it crusted up kind of like an improvised scab on top of it. Still to this day, I carry table salt with me when I'm in the woods, either in one of those same kind of cheap salt shakers or when I go to McDonald's or someplace like that, I tell them I need a handful of salt. They'll throw those little packets in the bag and I'll keep them in my pack. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll get the bleeding stopped, pour, for the most part, pour salt in it and then bandage it over top of the salt and just leave the salt in there. Then by the time I get back home and unbandage it, it's dried and caked completely on top of there and it's acting like an improvised scab. So that's a little trick that I've picked up from dad and use. I watched a video the other day where the guy said you can do the same thing with cayenne pepper. Never tried cayenne pepper. Might try it the next time I get cut just to see what it does. But I don't know. I've never used it, so I don't know if it works or not. Now, went over the bandana and how to use it. Let's get into my little boo-boo kit. Like I said, it's just a sandwich bag is all it is. But there's a lot of stuff in this. Get everything out of here. Oh, okay. Right off the bat, as you can see, gobs and gobs and gobs of band-aids in here because that's what you're going to use most of the time and these are just standard band-aids <clears throat> now you can do a couple of different things with these you can use these for your basic cuts and scrapes 
but you can also make butterfly bandages out of them. And to do that, I'll show you here in just a second. Let me just put it back up here. To do that, all you've got to have is just a pair of scissors, like on a Swiss Army knife, or there's my other multipliers, or on a set of multipliers. And on that, And cut it to where it looks like a bow tie, and you'd use that as an improvised butterfly bandage if you needed to. Uh, on top of carrying the band aids, I carry some 3x3 three three gauze pads. <clears throat> this one's open, and the reason it's open is because I've cut it down from time to time. And that's the thing about these three by three gauze is if you need the whole thing you've got it if not you can cut it down the ones I like are the ones that are folded up so you can unfold them and cut them down if you need to and use those to make band-aids and then put a piece of tape around it whatever you need to do depends on how much it's still bleeding when you get to that point carry just a tube of antibiotic ointment this is dollar store brand get them for a little or nothing there's more of the gauze pads these gauze pads are the three inch by three inch they come from walmart so i also carry a roll of gauze with me and this comes in handy if you get a cut and you want to wrap it good after you put your piece of gauze on it. So I always carry a little bit of that with me. We've got a boo-boo kit here at the house and all the same stuff's in it as well. I carry the one inch athletic tape. And I carry it because the plastic tape, I'm allergic to it, it makes my skin blister. And whenever I take it off, it just peels big pieces of skin off with it. But the good thing about the athletic tape is it tears easy. You can take it and tear it down to make smaller pieces for like when you're putting a splint on. piece won't be big enough to go all the way around my back finger in the back but at least get the idea to put a splint on and then the other thing and you've seen this before is I carry more of that stretchy tape and the reason I carry it is a lot of times after I'll put a band-aid on if I'm still going to be using that hand I'll take that stretchy tape and wrap around that finger as well. And it'll stretch and move with my finger and still allows me to use it in hand, but it keeps stuff out of the wound and keeps me from hanging the Band-Aid on something and pulling it off and so forth. <clears throat> so this is just the basics that I carry. I have yet to be out in the woods and get cut to the point that between what I have in this little boo-boo kit, the table salt and the bandana, I have yet to get in the woods and get cut to the point 
that I couldn't stop the bleeding with with that. Now, there's been times that I've stopped the bleeding, load everything back up, and then had to go home and get stitches, but at least control the bleeding, get it stopped, and able to get back to where I need to get stitches or whatever. Now, <clears throat> major cuts. And major cuts are the, the ones that we all should be worried about. Because if you get a major cut, you may not be able to stop the bleeding by the, any of these means that I've just shown you. And that is where tourniquet comes in. <clears throat> Everybody that goes into the woods uses knives, axes, saws, any of that kind of stuff should take a tourniquet with them. They're not very expensive. This is a cat tourniquet. I think you can find these things for 15, 20 bucks. So that's a good thing. It's like life insurance, I guess. Because if you were to get out there and fall and get a major cut on your arm, major cut on your leg, something to that extent, uh, have a tree fall and crush a hand or compound fracture an arm and the bone sticking out and you're bleeding, <clears throat> then something like that could save your life. And with the tourniquets, there's a couple of things that I've learned through my job from some military personnel as well that I never thought of. I always carried my tourniquet just like that with my windlass inside the catch with the strap around it. It had never occurred to me that if I get cut on an arm that I'm going to have to try and undo that tab with one hand. What I was told to do by a guy who put on a class for us at the academy and was a medic in the army was to put it just like that right there. That way that windlass is always there. You can get to it with one hand, whatever. The other thing he told us to do was to keep our tourniquet where it's kind of loose. That way, there you go. These cat tourniquets go through a buckle. They slide really, really easy, but some of them and, and different brands, you'll find that instead of going through like that one does, they'll go through a buckle like that. Problem. Got all of this, you throw it on your arm, you grab this, and pull and it won't do anything because that buckle creates tension and won't let it slide so if you do have one that's got a buckle like that undo it and stick it through just the one side and not both sides and the reason being same situation you throw it on you grab that tab and then you can adjust it and tighten it down with one hand. Now, tourniquet placement. <clears throat> I thought for years that if I got a cut here, I needed to go right there and put the tourniquet on. That's not right. And <clears throat> I have now learned that no matter what's going on, you want to go as high on the appendage as you can get it. So even if I got cut here, I would still want to come 
all the way up to the top and put that tourniquet on as high as I could get it. Just like that. And then, of course, you start tightening your windlass down. When you get it tight, you hook it. Put that across there just so it doesn't pop out, and there you go. Now, when you get that tourniquet on there good and tight, and the bleeding slows and comes to a stop, that arm's not useless. You can still move it. One of the things they had us do in that class was to put the tourniquet on our leg as high up as we could get it, and then tighten it down till it hurt, and then had us get up, go outside, and walk all the way around the building and come back in. Just to show that even though we had that tourniquet on, we could still get up and still be mobile and still do what we needed to. <clears throat> Same thing if you're putting it on a leg. Now, legs are tricky. Sometimes you can't get this thing over the top of the person's foot and all the way up to where it needs to be. Say you're roll up on a wreck and guy's got his foot trapped and you can't get it, then you'll just have to unbuckle it and run it around and then put it on that way. Just like that. And the guy that was the medic in the military, he said, you put that on, he said, pull it tight enough before you ever use the windlass, pull it tight enough that the person you put it on hollers. He said, then you know you got it tight enough. He said, then tighten it down with the windlass and you should be good to go. Oh, we're rolling up on about 25 minutes, so <laughs> I'm going to cut this at this. I hope you found it interesting. Like, share, subscribe. One other thing. One other thing, for real quick. Sorry about that. On a major cut, like to your leg, your arm, whatever, when you get that tourniquet on and get the bleeding stopped, Depends on the kind of wound. If it's a wide gaping wound, you still may have to take your bandana and kind of poke it into that wound and then wrap the leg up and pack that wound with your bandana. Your gauze, whatever, depends on what size of wound it is. So, sorry I forgot that part. But uh, those are all the items that I carry with me. Out of all of them, the bandana is probably the most important because I can stop bleeding with it. I can make a bandage out of it. If I get a decent scratch, cut, scrape, whatever on my arm, I can take that bandana and make a bandage out of it and bandage it up. Just simple overhead knot on the back and pull it tight. And that'll work until I can get the bleeding stop. But all that being said, I'm going to finish this one up. You all like, share, subscribe, and I'll get another one up for you soon.